Hello, this is Catherine, Executive Communications for 3DBLM. If you've ever wanted to start and run your own personal business, this is the expert source of information from experts you and need, whether you create a startup, acquisition or franchise. The 3D Business Launch Model, created by Gene H. Irwin, covers all aspects of developing and running your own home-based business. He is your personal mentor in developing any type of business. This podcast will greatly add to your understanding of all matters relating to your own home-based business. Thanks, Catherine. Hello, friend. This is Gene Irwin, founder of the 3D Business Launch Model, designed to help you discover and create your perfect own home-based business. This episode number two is focused on one thing. Exactly what business do you want? Because of the amount of content this podcast covers is such a broad spectrum, we are breaking it up into four different subparts. Part A, what type of business do you want? Part B, examples of self-employed and home-based businesses. Part C, examples of franchises under $50,000 and up to $100,000. And finally, Part D, examples of annual income per type of business. When you complete all four parts of the podcast, you'll have a very good idea of which type of business you want to do. You will know what self-employment and home-based businesses look and feel like. And you'll know how much this is going to cost. And finally, what should your average yearly income be from over some of the more popular 40 different and home-based careers? I'm your host, Gene H. Irwin, founder of the 3D Business Launch Model with over $275 million dollars creating businesses large and small. Let's get started on podcast number two, What Business Do You Want? Hello, this is Gene Irwin, founder of the 3D Business Launch Model. This is our first podcast and video installment of topics to address the question, what business do you want? But because we're using third-party content, it's important you understand Contents of this material may not be reproduced or disseminated for any reason without the express written and direct consent of Global Funding and Acquisitions Corporation in advance of such reproduction or use. References used in this material are the copyright and ownership of the companies so referenced. See their website for details. Global Funding or Gene H. Irwin are not responsible for the accuracy or content of referenced companies or products. Hello, friend. If you recall, the topic for this podcast was going to be self-employed businesses, home-based businesses, top franchises under $50,000, and top franchises under $100,000. But in some of those cases, we were waiting for approval to use third-party content for self-employed businesses. As such, we're still waiting, so we are going to use our own examples and definitions to help you understand the top self-employed businesses and so forth, by using something called how we define the type of business for your consideration. Some of you may recall that I have looked at over 3,000 companies in order to acquire them for an investment firm or from companies who wish to acquire them to expand their business. In the process of doing that, I've evaluated, as I mentioned, thousands of companies from less than $5,000 a year in revenue to more than $100 million a year in revenue and the challenges that they face are similar. However, there's approximately eight or nine different types of businesses that fall into categories that are fairly easy to spot over the decades of my life. And I wanted you to understand what those types are because most likely your home-based or self-employed business is going to fall into one of those categories. So we're going to spend the better part of this podcast explaining to you what those types are so you can understand how to take advantage of my counsel to you. better understand how this is going to work, I'm going to call out each of the eight different types of self-employment targets for your consideration, and I'm going to spend great detail with each one of those areas so you can get a feel for what type of businesses are available in that particular category or type, and then we can decide together how to best approach that for your particular situation. So in our opinion, These are the following business categories that we look at as probable self-employment targets for your consideration. So let's both do some homework. The first one, A, service businesses. Service businesses are defined by things like hairdressers, groomers, landscape, elder care, medical treatment, senior care, home services, child care, and so forth may be required of licenses for the individual and the facility. The next 
as B is installation and repairs. Things like HVAC, which stands for heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Plumbing, auto, home, equipment, sandy man, most are bonded, insured, some are licensed. The third one is construction. These are home builders, heavy equipment, subcontractors, sheetrock, book laying, almost always licensed and almost have a very expensive equipment. Number four are direct sales, like business to consumer, business to business, product sales, some commission only, such as real estate agent or insurance agents, and most of those are licensed. Number five, consulting, just like we are tonight, online teaching, coaching, speaking, tutoring, training online, expert mentoring, and in-person on-site consulting. Number six, transportation. Think Lyft, Uber, hauling, delivery services, DoorDash, aviation, etc. Number seven, e-commerce. Anything online or e-commerce products or SAS, which means sales, uh, which means software as a service sales, blogging, podcast, videos, website development, software, drone services, online courses. And finally, number eight, consumables. Think of these as restaurants, food preparation, consumption, fuel, entertainment, sporting events, music, dance, or theatrical concerts. Now, with all these different types of businesses for your consideration, we're going to take a look at each one of those in particular. Then I'm going to give you decades of experience of hindsight and insight as to what kind of business it means, what kind of challenges you're going to face. So each of those eight areas, I want you to remember the ones that are most important to you. And if necessary, take some notes or give me a call. Give us a call here at... uh, 1-800-750-8767, and we'll walk you through some of those steps, or you can contact me through our email service, which is ghigfac at aol.com. So here we go. We're going to start now and going into detail in these various types of services, one of which is certain to be of interest to you. The first type of business we're going to look at is something called the service business. As I mentioned, these are things like hairdresser, groomer, landscape, elder care, medical treatment, home services, senior care, child care. Some of these may be required to be licensed. Here are my thoughts and insight for you personally about the service industry. They have the following requirements in most instances. Number one, you most likely need a convenient place to provide that service and to store supplies and parts. Number two, Some services require licensing of person and, in some cases, the facility. Number three, service time slots are subject to timing interruptions. How many of us have been in a waiting room and wonder why in the world it's taken so long for them to see me? Number four, services may need to be guaranteed, especially if you install new parts. Those parts and the service will have to be guaranteed. Number five, some cases may leave you legally exposed because of the quality or the lack of service. Number six, in the service industry, marketing, as in advertising or find the client or the job to do, will be a strong barrier to entry. Number seven, networking with related business services will be key to this industry. Think about the groomers at PetSmart. The groomers is a separate company. Number eight, payment is due at the end of the service. You need a payment app like Square or PayPal or Zelle or something that you can use to to collect payments on, whether it's on your phone or on your computer or at the cash register. So those are the kind of areas in the service industry that are paramount to your success should you choose to be in a service business. Keep in mind, service businesses have hidden expenses. Think of a hairdresser at your local Great Clips or your local hair salon. Most likely, they don't own the business, number two. Number three, they probably rent or lease the stations at which they're working at. And number three, they have still some overhead expenses that they have to give to the owner of the business itself. So there are many things that go into being in the service business. But keep in mind, what we're trying to help you do and learn is something called your own home-based business so that you can avoid these additional 20 or 30% expenses. And sometimes you can work very quickly out of your garage, out of your home, for things like uh, landscape work, like groomers, sometimes home services, senior care, things of this nature. Keep in mind, you will be licensed or required to be licensed in some of those areas. 
The second part or type of business for your consideration is something called installation and repairs. These are things like HVAC, plumbing, auto repair, home repair equipment, handyman, most of which are bonded, insured, and in some cases licensed. Number one, you will most likely need a convenient place to provide the installation and repairs. Number two, some repairs require licensing of the person and in some cases the facility. Number three, and repairs are subject to guarantee, especially for new parts. Number four, installations may be limited for space. Think lifts and a car repair. One of the examples I gave in one of my videos, uh, guys was the, and gals, was something called the car wash syndrome. If you have a four bay car wash, you can only wash four cars at a time. And that's the problem with installation repair shops. They are limited for space and limited for capacity in order to work on one thing at a time. Think of it as a dentist's office. Some of these larger dental offices, if you notice, will have four or five or six chairs, but the dentist rotates from one client to the other. He doesn't work on all clients at the same time. He works on them in sequence and has teeth cleaning in one area, has x-rays going on in another area, he has extractions and things of this nature, all of which are lined up in sequence so that his time is more valuable as he works from one client to the next. And that's basically what he's doing. He's running an installation shop. Okay. Here's an interesting thing about installation and repairs. Now, I want you to think about your own home repairs, whether it's the cable man person, whether it's the person that comes in to do any work at your home or your office. Installation repairs are almost always and I mean always, aren't done on time, nor are they convenient. Installation repairs will need parts, sometimes not available, which requires disruption of home or disruption of business. Think plumbing situations. Number seven, unfortunately, some installers are not well trained. They leave the air in a mess and sometimes are rude to homeowners and business owners. And finally, number eight, do you really trust your mechanic? Because repair people have a very low trust and respect value from the consumers. This is an installation and repair business that's designed to help and solve some of the problems mechanically with things like your air conditioner, your plumbing, your auto, your home, and so forth. It's important you understand if that's an area you're going to be in, you need to give excellent service, consistent pricing, and you always want consistent referrals. This is a business where you have to develop high level of trust and respect, and that only comes from giving great service and a great value. C for construction. These are home builders, heavy equipment, subcontractors, sheetrock, bricklaying, etc. And most, if not all of these people, are usually licensed. Number one, construction. This is a take charge type of occupation, usually requiring a licensed and bonded operator and very expensive equipment. Number two, although a lucrative career, the barrier cost to entry is quite high due to the nature of construction equipment and the experience needed. Similar to repairs, this occupation is dependent upon critical parts and related components, including building materials. Most construction jobs require bidding against competition, but you can avoid this by being proactive in finding related opportunities in your area. Construction jobs require substantial insurance and financial backing to handle 1099 subcontractors who need to get paid immediately. Just like someone who gave you a service, they expect to be paid immediately, just like your groomer or just like the person who repaired your vehicle. Subcontractors usually get paid the moment their job is complete. Most of these jobs do not require a formal education, but certainly, certainly require street smarts and on-the-job expertise. Financing on both sides of a large construction job is critical because you can be left holding the losses for a non-paying client. Non-paying clients are subject to something called a contractor's lien, which makes it impossible to close funding or selling that product or that business or that opera opportunity until the contractor is paid first. Most men and some women think they can handle a construction job without experience and credibility. They can't, you can't, don't even try it. 
financial planning is best done by someone other than the equipment operator or business owner. Use a cash flow manager. Number 12. You want to invoice early, collect often, hold up the completion of the project until all back orders are paid. And when change orders are requested, get paid for them in advance. Number 13. Never get behind in receiving payments from the owner of the project or the mortgage or banking company. Stop work. Have not paid on time. Did I mention that cash flow management is critical to this type of business? Don't keep your subcontractors waiting to get paid. They'll lock your business up and shut it down. This is one of those businesses that you must stay on top of your finances on the front end every day, every day, every day. The next type of business we want to cover is something called direct sales. This is business to consumer, business to business. And these are products, services, and ideas and technology. Sometimes they're commission only, such as a real estate agent. Sometimes they're an insurance agent that sells something called a non-tangible product. Insurance agents and real estate agents have to be licensed and bonded. And they also have something called errors and emissions insurance in case they make a mistake. So it's important to understand these are the kind of products that go into direct sales, physically a product or a service or a technology, including software sales. Number one, my sincere recommendation to you, my friend, is to never try direct sales without getting a base salary first. Direct sales is tough sledding. If you have never sold something before, I don't care what the service or product is, you need to get a base salary Learn how to do counter sales first. Think of an auto parts store or think of working in retail. But before you begin direct sales, I'm going to make a recommendation to you. And that is number two. Take my mini course, which is provided to all clients of the 3D business launch model. And study very carefully the included product that I've created for you called the 8-Minute Presentation. It's important that you understand all four facets of that process, the 8-Minute Presentation. Number three. Try to work for companies or businesses that have you get paid in marketing while learning how to sell. Selling looks easy. It isn't. Number four, insist on getting trained by people whose careers and paycheck depends upon them making sales. Therefore, they've done it. They've walked the talk. Number six, direct sales can be learned in key situations in retail environments. You'll get a small salary, think counter sales, while learning sales. Number six, there are no born salesmen or saleswomen. All sales techniques and experience are achieved the hard way in personal trials and errors. Number seven, don't become an excellent salesperson. Instead, become an excellent communicator, an expert at asking questions and then listening to their answers. Someone said, number eight, selling ain't telling, asking is. That's how the pros do it. Number nine, become an expert first in yourself, your company, and then the product or service that your company provides. Number 10, people want what you have to sell. Just make sure you know your products and services then back them up with high quality support. Number 11, how's your attitude? How's your confidence? Do you have issues at work? Do you have issues at home? Don't we all? Continue to monitor the altitude of your attitude daily if you're going to be in direct sales. Number 12, it's not a numbers game. I don't care what your managers say. It's not a numbers game. It's about you being an expert in the game. You first, then the company, product, and service. Get it right every time. Number 13, competition is not going to play fair. They will lie, cheat, and steal. You'll have to do a better job than they are. And you'll have to do a better job than that every time, all the time. Number 14. Salespeople have a very low trust by customer credibility. Think car salesman. In fact, if you're in direct sales, have you told your mom what you do for a living? At number 15, to prove the lack of trust in salespeople, let me ask you this question. What do you say when a salesperson approaches you? Probably something like just looking. See what I mean? We're a little more than halfway through what we call our types of businesses for your consideration. 
The next section is E, considering consulting. What is consulting? These are things like online teaching, coaching, speaking, tutoring, training online, and expert mentoring, and in-person, on-site consulting. Our definition of a consultant is one who is an expert and technically trained in a subject matter. We call that SME, which means subject matter expert, or who has spent years of expert experience. Number two, coaches, teachers, ESL, in other words, English is a second language, and tutoring can be done in person or can be done from your spare bedroom online around the world. Number three, consultants in my world earn upwards of $750 an hour depending on the need of the client and the expected results of counsel. Number four, some years ago, one of my coworkers left our nuclear science group. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I was a nuclear engineer and came back as a 1099 independent contractor in exactly the same job, but made more money. Now, how did that happen? Why would he make more money after leaving his position, like the rest of us, as a nuclear scientist? And the reason is the company could hire him back at lower cost because he was responsible for his own health care. He was responsible for his own state and federal taxes. He was responsible for his own Medicare costs. And those kinds of things helped the employer hired him back at a lower rate to them, but a higher rate to him. Does that make sense? I made a comment about that in one of my videos. Take a look at it. Number five, major challenges with consulting include, number one, topics. Number two, Clients, number three, product, number four, service delivery, and number five, agreement of the objectives met. In other words, you're all alone as a consultant. You do the marketing, you find the client, you take care of the client, you take uh, care of the charge and the client, what your fees are going to be, and then you take care of the collections. And that becomes sometimes the more difficult part of the job is collecting for your service. Number six. Most consultants must learn quickly to become master communicators who have impeccable credentials and confidence. If you look at some of my experience and what we call this podcast number one, you're going to find impeccable credentials. Number seven, if you have specific experience and recently been furloughed, coming back as a cheaper to them 1099 contractor might work. It saves them money. They get to hire somebody that they're familiar with who's very expert at doing the job and both parties win. You get a little bit more money, you take on a little bit more responsibility of your taxes and your Medicare costs and so forth and your health insurance, but they get exactly a better qualified person at lower cost. That's the goal. And you still get to keep your job. Number eight, I remember years ago, that first Monday at home, not going into the nuclear plant as a scientist. There you go. I remember how lonely I felt that first Monday without having a job. And I worried about it for the next couple of days because I didn't know what I would do next. I figured it out. It took a while. Number nine, I'll remind you what one of my favorite bosses said. He said, Gene, plan your work, then work your plan. That was wise counsel then and now. Number 10, listen very carefully. It is better to have a solid plan with financial reserves than try and wing it as a consultant, you can't fake it until you make it. You'll be found out within the first few minutes. You tell me that you're an engineer, I'm going to ask you three questions. 80% of the people who tell me they are, aren't. Number 11, several companies would hire you as a 1099 independent contractor, which is consulting, so you can gain the experience and increase your consulting chops. That's how you do it, folks. Glad to help you any way I can man, woman, or child. Now, I have to tell you, when I say child, you better be at least 18 years old. Okay, this is Gene Irwin, founder of the 3D Business Launch Model. Hey, friend, we're going to wrap up this 2A section of exactly what business you want by talking to you about the following two things. Number one, we're going to talk to you about transportation, and we're going to talk to you about e-commerce. This next section of what we call a type of business for your consideration 
My friend, is something called transportation. It has taken the world by storm in the last three years, especially during this pandemic. Usually, everybody knows how to drive. So suddenly, things like Lyft, Uber, hauling and delivery services, and DoorDash, etc., those kind of things just cropped up out of nowhere. And so you can grab a part-time job doing those kind of things. You get to expend your own money on insurance and travel expenses like gas and so forth. But still, it's something you can do with virtually no experience, no education, no training. Just have to be on time from A to B, and there you go. You get paid directly from Lyft or Uber. Now, an interesting thing has happened in California. Do you know what it is? Apparently, there's a state law that they're trying to pass, if they have it already, that says Uber drivers and Lyft drivers have to be employees of the company. Do you know what that does to your 1099 income? It throws it out the window. The reason is, if you're an employee, you get paid exactly what that carrier or company is going to tell you you're going to get paid, regardless of how many miles driven or the number of clients that you have. And you lose all your tax benefits and breaks as being a 1099 contractor. I wouldn't put up with it, but that's just me. Okay. On July 12th, 2022, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California said the following, under California's law known as AB5, a worker is presumed to be an employee unless the party hiring the person can show the worker as an independent contractor under the three-factor ABC test. The classification rule affects thousands of gig workers who get flexibility and lack employer-paid protection such as workers' compensation and unemployment benefits. The Ninth Circuit's ultimate decision is the high-profile case likely to be appealed to the Supreme Court? Let me explain how this works. I'm reading this story to you because it is very important for you to understand that the rules and laws of various states affect your freedom when it comes to being an independent contractor. So, here's a three-part basic ABC test used in most states. An individual performing any service shall be considered employee and not an independent contractor unless, and here's what's interesting, you're guilty unless you're proved innocent. The individual is free from control and direction in connection with the performance of the service, both under the contract for the performance of service, and in fact, Part B, the service is performed outside the usual course of the business of the employer, and Part C, the individual is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, profession, or business of the same nature as that involved in the service provided. What this means is that a worker providing services is deemed an employee and not an independent contractor unless they meet all of the three ABC prongs. Conversely, if they meet all three prongs, they are deemed an independent contractor, not an employee. So you're guilty until you're proven innocent, at least in the state of California and some others. I think it's an affront to your independence. I think it's an affront to your freedoms. But that's just my opinion. I've been on 1099 for so many years and so forth that I can't even imagine what it's like to work for somebody else. And I'll explain to you a little bit later in this podcast why that's the case. Eh, I'll take a minute now and tell you why it's the case. I am certainly convinced and hopefully will convince you that people that came across the puddle, meaning the Atlantic, approximately 300 years ago, left family and friends and their country and in most cases came over here looking for a new life. They came over here looking for an opportunity to have their own land and their own homes and their own challenges ahead of them. And they risk literally risks life and limb to come here. And not one of those people, when they got to shore, said the following, I sure hope I can find somebody who wants to hire me so I can work for them. That's right. There were no people on those ships hoping to get hired by somebody else when they got over here. That's my point. So when I grew up in a self-employed family, I didn't <laughs> I didn't know any better. That's all I knew is how to be self-employed. I eventually got hired by people and yes, I actually worked for the company for I don't know, 20 years I guess. But still that doesn't mean that the like you I didn't want to have my own business so I can be my own boss, control my time, control my money, and so forth. Apparently, it seems to be working out because I'm still here. Okay, this section six is about transportation, things like Lyft, Uber, and hauling. 
So here we go. Here's my insight on the transportation business. Number one, without guaranteed contracts, such as an over-the-road semi-truck driver agreements, this is a very low income opportunity. Full-time truck drivers with commercial licenses have an income ranging between $31,500 a year to approximately $68,000 a year. Like Indiana Jones movie, choose wisely. Number three, how you feel about trans how do you feel about transporting someone in inclement weather? I'm from Montana. Snow is often four to six feet deep and 20 degrees below zero. No thanks. Number four, some transportation jobs, such as Lyft and Uber, require you to use your own vehicle. Is it in good condition? Would your mom ride in your car with you? Number five, some individuals and companies do quite well in developing a hotshot delivery service over time. If you do that, I suggest that you get a good device to help you with your navigation. I also suggest you find good routes and kind police. Number six, the first major use of airplanes in the United States was for the U.S. Postal Service and it quickly delivering mail nationwide, causing the demise of the Pony Express to go out of business. Number seven, perhaps you want to compete with FedEx, UPS, or USPS. For those of us that don't have any idea what USPS means, it means the United States Postal Service, which in fact is not a federal company. Anyway, be something like Amazon delivery. Anything is possible. My neighbor has daily clients pick up their packages over there at their home. I wouldn't want to do that. Number eight, transporting is not a very technical job, but sometimes routing software may be needed to maximize profits and minimize cost of time and fuel. And finally, just an aside, my brother-in-law Spent over 40 years driving for a little-known company called UPS, United Parcel Service. He's seen technical changes over those decades, and in the process of doing that, uh, did extremely well for him and his family. And in the process, he found out, and they found out, that primarily they turn only in one direction on their routes so that they can minimize the risk of injury and the risk of uh, accidents by managing their time. Finally, they started putting onboard computers on every single truck, and that individual driving that truck had to keep track of literally every minute of every day in their transportation costs, as well as their transportation times from place to place. That's kind of like Big Brother in a serious way. Anyway, just my opinion. My friends, we just have two more areas I'm gonna cover on this podcast, we'll give you some additional insight and information as we go along, but I want to talk to you about right now, number seven, we want to talk to you about e-commerce. E-commerce is everything to do with online sales. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's online, it's e-commerce. These are things like software as a service, sales, blogging, podcast, videos, website development, software, Joan services and online courses. I'm sure there's some others that you can think of, like TikTok, whatever that is, and services to individuals. We'll go over probably 30 or 40 different company opportunities for you and various businesses you can run right out of your home. And uh, you know that there's some very successful bloggers. You probably have friends or family in that business nationwide that just love to talk about topics. That's fine. I guess that's what I'm doing, isn't it? Podcast for 3D Business Launch Model and how we define a type of business. The last second to the last portion is something called e-commerce. Here are my thoughts. Number one, the majority of the products and services in the e-commerce sector are consumed products and virtual in nature, such as courses. Number two, with literally millions of websites and videos uploaded daily, the consumer challenge is finding authentic and valuable content resources without getting ripped off through hackers. Number three, anyone with a smartphone or laptop can begin a blog, podcast, video, website, software, and online courses. The cost of entry is low. With the cost of entry also comes the cost of exposure to your business, to your family, to your location, and the privacy of your home and your business. Be very careful with what you do in the e-commerce work. Make sure that your work and your development and so forth is sound. Make sure that you put the necessary software uh, compliance areas in place so that you're protected legally as well as financially. Number four, 
Although larger companies use SAS or software as a service, initial clients don't want to use cloud storage of their confidential data. Number five, as I mentioned, security risk is high in this particular business segment and expertise is necessary to maintain client protection. Such protection is costly. Number six, pundits abound on every topic, on every distribution channel. Unfortunately, the use of civility and discourse is long gone from our society. Number seven, online interactions have replaced and displaced face-to-face -face conversations. People forget that facial expressions and body language count. Number eight, professional crime syndicates troll the world wide web for targets. And your business data is always at risk. While you think you're safe, you aren't. Number nine, in spite of the risks and inundation of data, the internet and access to information, products and services worldwide is nothing short of remarkable. And number 10, e-commerce is a true ABC market of opportunity and risk. ABC, always be careful and teach your kids about stranger danger online. You just Folks, you just got to police that all the time with your kids and ourselves. We need to be very cautious what we're doing. We need to be careful of the type of people that we rely on. And hopefully you can rely on my experience and technology experience and success in coaching hundreds of people around the world. But you do need to be very careful who you're talking to and who you're listening to. And I hope that you find the very best in the materials we're trying to provide to you. You can go online and find some of the books that I've written. You can go online and find some of the videos I've provided to you and others. And I do that free. Well, let's see. We are on the end of this podcast here in just a second. In the next section, for this section A of podcast, where we talk about what kind of business do you want? We're going to kind of complete section A that talks about what type of business do you want for your consideration? We're going to talk about something called consumables. In this final portion of section A, where we talk about the type of business for your consideration, we're going to talk about the eighth portion of it, or eighth type, called consumables. Now, what's a consumable? Well, think about it for a minute. We are customers, but we're a consumable nation in a consumable world. We consume things. We buy gas, put it in the car, and we charge it up with electricity and drive down the road. But eventually it runs out. We have to recharge it or fill it up again. We go to a restaurant, have dinner. The next day we're hungry. You've got to do that again. We go to lounges, food preparation. We have consumption of products and services like software. We need fuel. We need entertainment. We go to a sporting events, music, dance, and theatrical concerts. All of these kinds of things are fleeting in nature and not permanent on the shelf. In other words, once you have a need and you serve that need, you no longer have a need. In other words, you just came home from a wonderful four-course meal. <laughs> the, the next thing you need is somebody say, listen, let's go out and have dinner. You say, I just got home from dinner. <laughs> so basically, that's how a consumable market works. If your need is filled, you don't need it any right now. Um, you might need it in the next couple of hours, next couple of days, but right now you're, you're taken care of. Okay, number one, when I analyzed companies nationwide, the restaurant slash lounge business was always the highest turnover rate of at least 80%. Let me say that again. The restaurant and lounge business is a burnout business. It will run you to the ground and back again. Always the highest turnover rate of your employees. Usually a cash business and a very expensive cash business, unfortunately because there's a lot of theft involved. There's a lot of miss, what's the word I'm looking for? All right, people lie, cheat, and steal. Let's just leave it at that. That could be your consumers, that could be your bartender, that could be your waitress. So it's a very interesting business where you have to be on top of everything. That's why they have the eye in the sky. Think of going into a casino and you look up and you're gonna see hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of cameras that are spying on every move you make. <laughs> it sounds like a song. And they're also spying on every move the dealer makes at the, well, the roulette table, at the, uh, the the different card game tables, whatever they're called, and so forth. So a consumable market with its cash-only business is one that's fraught with risk and fraught with temptation. Just be aware of that. 
When I sat down with companies to help them analyze why they wanted to sell their restaurant or their lounge or both, first thing I asked them every time, I said, well, how's that ankle feel? They said, what are you talking about? What do you mean my ankle? Well, I see that you're chained to the desk or you're chained to the bar stool. How does it feel? I said, oh, I hate it. I'm here 20 hours a day. I can't get away from it. Even on Sundays, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I even live upstairs. It's worse than that. I, I live upstairs. I said, yeah, it's kind of why I thought I'm here. Because it's not because your business is running fine. You got lots of money and so forth. In fact, <laughs> I got to tell you this real quick story. I went to investigate a company and I think it was in one of the Western states like Wyoming or Idaho. I'm not sure. And I walked in this guy's office and he said, uh, let's go to my office. Now his office and my definition of office were two different things. He literally had a broom closet, and that's where he had his little tiny desk and a little tiny chair. There was no room for me to fit in his, literally, a broom closet. And so I sat out in the hall with a folding chair, and I chatted to him privately in our conversation. It was midday, so there weren't any clients around. And it was a cash business. And I asked him the following question. He said, well, why don't we start by taking a look at your books? Now, folks, listen very carefully, my friend, to what his response was. Okay, sure, that's fine. Would you um, would you like to see the books that we send to the IRS? Or would you like to see the books that I uh, send to my CPA? Or, I'm not kidding, or would you like to see the books we provide my wife? And then he said, or would you like to look at mine? <laughs> he had, I'm not kidding, he had and managed weekly four completely different sets of books. Keep in mind, it's a, it's a cash business for the most part. I was blown, I thought I heard everything. <laughs> that just blew me right out of my chair. And my, my uh, response was, of course, well, listen, <laughs> so listen why, don't we, why don't we just start with yours? And so that's my counsel to you is if you're in that business, be very, very cautious. Number two, in the restaurant business, as I mentioned in my fast food franchise video, you must control the cost of food and the cost of wages. Number three, here we go again. The number one headache in running a business is the people who work there. Schedules are a nightmare. Morale is typically pretty low, and I guarantee you it's drama queen and drama king night every day. It's a drama nightmare. Number four, did I mention I don't care for the restaurant lounge business? Yes, it's a cash and carry business and eternal losses are large. Theft is rampant. Number five, yeah, final comment about lounges. You will always be at legal risk with any customer who drinks and drives after leaving your place of business. Be very, very careful that your liability insurance is protecting you, your company, and your assets if this is the business you want to be in. Okay, I lied to you. Number six. Okay, final comment about fast food business. Besides food and wages, as owners, especially of a fast food business or especially of one that's use younger adults, as owner, you're constantly involved as a glorified adult babysitter. Number seven, I lied again. Why adult babysitter? Because 75% of your employees in the fast food business are kids, 16 and older, and haven't been taught respect and the work ethic. Number eight, a consumable market. The one thing I do like about it is it's repeat business. That's the point of a consumable market. Think fuel, food, and to some extent, electricity, water, septic, and so forth. That's why companies like your power company, your water company, and your local town septic company are gleefully able to send you out their garbage truck because they know every month you're going to pay a garbage bill. Every month you're going to pay a sewer bill, water bill, electric bill. They love the fact that you're a captive audience in their town for something called a consumable market, typically controlled by the state or city government. Number nine, repeat business is a boon to online businesses that subscribe you to their monthly service. 
Think subscription delivery of products and services that come to you every month on a regular basis along with their attendant billing. Number 10. Everybody likes movies of some type, theatrical shows, something on TV, dance, concerts, and going out. Owning that type of business is extremely, and I do mean extremely, expensive. Number 11. Event owners have huge liability risks of someone getting hurt. On the field, in the stands, in the parking lot, or unfortunately in this day and age, getting shot. I'm just saying. Well, this is Gene Irwin, the founder of the 3D Business Launch Model. And we just finished talking to you in this portion of the podcast dealing with what we call the type of business for your consideration and the different kinds of businesses that you're trying to learn in something called what business do you want? We'll talk to you in just a few minutes about the next section that deals with what business do you want? But I wanted to reiterate the fact that you just listened to the service business, installation repairs, construction, direct sales, consulting, transportation, e-commerce, and finally the consumables market. Someone there is your dream business. Our next podcast to be in this series, What Business Do You Want? We'll go into details about specific self-employed and home-based businesses. This takes the concept of several different categories in 2A and goes into detail for several businesses you can create at home. We are excited to help you grow and succeed. Before we move on to the next podcast 2B, please answer the following two-part question. Part A. Which of the eight types and categories interest you? And part B, what is your specific example of business focus at this time? Please email your response to us at ghigfac at aol.com and put response type of business in the subject line of your email. Or if you'd rather leave us a short message, do so at 800-750-8767. We'll try to respond to each of your comments as time permits. This is Gene Irwin, founder of the 3D Business Launch Model, and helping you develop and own your own home-based business.